Our people expect their president and the Congress to find essential agreement on issues of great moment, the wise resolution of which will better shape the future of the nation. Never better than in those times of great challenge when we came together not as Democrats or Republicans, but as Americans united in a common cause. Because of the political divisions we see in our country today, I also think it is a counter model for how people ought to make all kinds of decisions. We can decide to come together and make our country reflect the good inside us. And together, we shall write an American story, a story of decency and dignity, love and healing, greatness and goodness. May this be the story that guides us. Good evening and welcome to tonight's public forum brought to you by Common Ground Committee and the Bridge Alliance. I'm Bruce Bond, CEO and co-founder of Common Ground Committee, and I'd like to thank Debbie Lynn Molino, CEO and president and co-founder of the Bridge Alliance, for partnering with us tonight to kick off the National Week of Conversation. And on behalf of my colleagues, the Common Ground Committee and our media partner, the Christian Science Monitor, thank you all for attending. The video you just watched gives you a flavor of our organization. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit group focused on bringing light, not heat, to public discourse and healing to the challenges of incivility and polarization that threaten our country. This is the 16th public forum that we've held, and tonight's topic is finding common ground on media, politics, and polarization. We encourage you to tweet, and indeed, we have three hashtags that we're using for tonight's event. They are Hashtag news, politics, polarization, hashtag find common ground, and hashtag common ground event. Now let me introduce our incredible panel, all three distinguished broadcast journalists who started out in local news and moved on to the major networks, each covering the White House beat along the way. First, I'm thrilled to introduce our moderator, Jacqueline Adams. Jackie spent more than two decades as an Emmy award-winning CBS News correspondent five of those years as a White House correspondent during the Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush administrations. Jackie is the co-author of A Blessing, Women of Color Teaming Up to Lead, Empower, and Thrive. A graduate of Harvard Business School, she currently serves on the board of directors of the Harvard Business School Club of New York, the largest HBS alumni club in the world. And now let me introduce our special guests. A seasoned and award-winning journalist, Chris Wallace, has interviewed top newsmakers from Washington's power players to world leaders. He recently left his longtime seat as host of Fox News Sunday to join CNN Plus. Obviously, there's some news there, and we'll see if there's anything he can share about it. Chris is one of the country's most prominent political journalists. Over his decades-long career, he reported from the ABC News desk as a senior correspondent for Primetime in 2020 and as an anchor on NBC News Meet the Press. He has won every major broadcast news award, including three Emmys. Along with Chris, we're excited to have with us tonight the award-winning journalist, Jonathan Carl. Jonathan is the chief Washington correspondent for ABC News and a co-anchor of This Week with George Stephanopoulos. He is the former president of the White House Correspondents Association and served as the chief White House correspondent for ABC News from December 2012 through the end of the Trump administration in January 2021. John is the author of the 2020 book, Front Row at the Trump Show, and the 2021 book, Betrayal, the Final Act of the Trump Show. Both books are New York Times bestsellers. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. And with that, I hand the floor over to Jackie Adams. Thank you for your very generous introductions, Bruce. It's an honor to join you and our esteemed panelists this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our audience for submitting so many insightful questions in advance. Many of them will be woven into our discussion and others we've saved for the end of our discussion. I want to give you a brief roadmap uh, to the hour that we've planned. We're going to tackle three major topics, the public's perception of the media and polarization, the power of the media, 
and then a few possible solutions for decreasing polarization. We'll pose the audience's excellent questions and then ask Chris and Jonathan for a few closing thoughts. So let's dive in. Political polarization is a problem in our society, and we'd like to discuss whether we can return to a place of less division. How do we get there, and can we make progress? Does the media play a role in deepening the divide, and or does it have the power to bring society closer together, to find common ground? Let's take a look at this Gallup poll of 1,005 adults from September of 2021. No surprise, the public's trust in the media is divided by political party. The top top line in blue represents Democrats having the most trust in media. The red line at the bottom represents Republicans whose trust has fallen to extreme lows. Now let's talk about why. The American Press Association states that the central purpose of journalism is to provide citizens with accurate and reliable information they need to function in a free society. When I went to journalism school, we were taught to focus on the ABCs, accuracy, brevity, and clarity. Journalists historically have served as watchdogs. Indeed, we've been dubbed the fourth estate holding feet to the fire of those in the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of government. Our role is to inform the public and offer a voice to the voiceless. So let's uh, talk a bit more about this. John, you first. Why do you think the public's trust in journalism is so divided? Are news organizations owning up to journalism's obligations to accuracy as well as truth? Well, we saw in that poll that the 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 largest factor, first of all, this is a long-term trend, but but the largest factor in the recent decline uh, in trust in news organizations is, is, is a, a full drop-off among Republicans. Um, and I don't think that's surprising at all, given that the uh, most prominent Republican figure in the country uh, for the past six years uh, made it a point to essentially declare war on the mainstream media. I mean, Donald Trump, uh, not only declared the press uh, the enemy of the people, he also, I think, more insidiously uh, declared the press the opposition party. And you know, if you have the person with the biggest megaphone day after day, day after day, calling what it was flatly real news fake news, uh, and and eroding, you know, uh, doing everything he can using his power to erode trust in the media. Not surprisingly, you're going to see an impact among Republicans, but that's not the entire story. Um, I, I think that um, one, of the, one of the reasons why I, I call the, the idea of the, of the press as the opposition party even more insidious than, than declaring uh, the press enemies of the people is um, that, that it was encouraging p- people, Republicans, to view everything that comes out of a mainstream news organization as being no different from a press release out of the political party. Uh, That's my opposition party. What do you expect? Of course they're against me. It's not true. They're just out to get me. And unfortunately, I do think that uh, over the course of of the Trump era, that the press often played right into that. Um, And and in fact, uh, acted in a way uh, as an opposition party, further uh, fueling this distrust. So it's not just... You know, Trump out there with this kind of monomaniacal attack, relentless attack uh, on on the press and attack attack on good journalism. Uh, but it created this sense that you know journalists needed to defend themselves, needed to push back against this, needed to push back against the president who was often not telling the truth. And in doing so, looking to a lot of Republicans, like we really are the opposition party. Chris, do you agree? What, why do you think there's such a divergence of trust in the media based on political party? Well, I, I agree with an, a lot of what John said, but I do think, and and John certainly suggested this, I think it goes way before, uh, precedes Trump by, by decades. Um, and I think of my former place of business, Fox News. And uh, back in 1996, uh, a number of news organizations were trying to decide whether to take on CNN uh, 
in cable because CNN was making huge amounts of money and they had the whole cable playing field to themselves. I was at that time where John now works at ABC and Rune Arledge uh, and Disney, which had taken over ABC, they looked at this and MSNBC and NBC, uh, or, or, or Microsoft and NBC were together getting uh, and forming MSNBC. So that now there was going to be CNN and MSNBC. And Rune came to the conclusion, I remember, that uh, if they got into cable, ABC and Disney, and so there are a lot of deep pockets there, that they were going to split this pie and uh, they were going to lose $50 million a year for 10 years. They were going to lose half a billion dollars, which in, that, in those days seemed like real money. <laughs> Conversely, uh, Rupert Murdoch and, and uh, Roger Ailes came to a different conclusion, which was there wasn't one pie. That, there, that, there was the CNN pie, which was going to get cut up, but that there was a huge market that wasn't watching cable, that didn't feel satisfied either with cable, CNN, or with the mainstream media, felt that they all tilted to the left and that he could create his own pie and have all of the pie. And I think one of the huge reasons for the success of Fox News over the years is because there was a, 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 a sizable audience, millions of people, who felt underserved or unserved uh, and and the differentiated product that Roger and Rupert provided uh, gave them uh, a, a news outlet uh, that they hadn't heard before or seen before. So I, I, what the, my main point is that this polarization in this sense among millions of Americans, and I certainly think Trump was an accelerant in all this, but th this sense uh, among millions of Americans that there's an inside game, a mainstream media, an establishment that tilts left, uh, and isn't speaking to or for them, uh, that's existed for decades. Well, both of your answers lead us to our second topic, the power of the press. How stories are reported can have real-world impact, and we have evidence of this in a chart from March 22nd. Uh, it was an Axios uh, Ipsos survey called Snapshot of America. And the data reflects the two-year mark in the COVID pandemic. As we can see, a significant driver of opinion is people's news source, with Fox News and conservative outlet customers differing substantially from MSNBC and CNN viewers. The blue line at the top represents CNN and MSNBC. The red line near the bottom represents Fox News. And the yellow line is labeled as none, and that represents people whose main news source was not listed or is out of the mainstream. The chart captures the, of the perceived risk of COVID. And as you can see, the difference is dramatic. Mm -hmm. People who watch CNN and MSNBC feel much more at risk from COVID, almost three times as much risk than those who watch Fox News. Now, Chris, you and I sat in adjoining broadcast booths when you were an NBC News White House correspondent and I was at CBS. You decamped to Fox News, as you mentioned, and recently you moved to CNN+. Plus. You said in recent interviews of your decision to leave Fox that you're, quote, fine with opinion, conservative opinion, liberal opinion, but when people start to question the truth, who won the 2020 election, was January 6th an insurrection, that's when you, quote, found that unsustainable. Now, the chart we just showed illustrates that how news is presented and which stories dominate coverage can shape how the public thinks about different issues. Is this part of the polarization problem? Yeah, except the only thing I would say in terms of COVID is that I think COVID very unfortunately became a politically polarized issue. And, you know, I'm of the generation that grew up in the 50s when polio vaccine, the salt vaccine came along and we, and especially our parents, viewed it all as a miracle and couldn't wait to get it. And I can remember lining up in, at PS6 in New York in the assembly uh, to get my polio shot. And there was no politics to it at all. It was a terrible scourge, and this was going to help protect us from the scourge. 
and we were thrilled by it. Uh, clearly, Trump particularly and Republicans more broadly took a very different attitude towards COVID and restrictions and lockdowns and masks uh, than, than Democrats did. So to a certain degree, the fact that, that Fox viewers had a different view, yes, that there certainly have been uh, reports on Fox that I think have played into that. But uh, I think to a large degree, it was kind of a choose your own adventure. If you were a liberal Democrat, you're, uh, and, you know, you had a certain view of the world and you, that view is also going to be bolstered by what you're seeing on the networks you choose to watch, like CNN and MSNBC. Conversely, if you're a Republican and you're following and supporting Trump and listening to him and DeSantis and Greg Abbott and on and on, you're watching Fox News. So I, I think it's kind of an echo chamber of politics and media. I think uh, I think that the media uh, kind of followed the political divide here, did, didn't create the political divide. John, do yeah, you I, agree? I, 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 totally, I totally agree with that. And this is another thing, like the, 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 the issue of uh, trust in the media that has been a long time in coming, it way predates... Uh, uh, the pandemic, and, and th that is the the whole anti-vaccine movement. Uh, I mean, I remember, I'm sure Chris does too, uh, doing stories about Michelle Bachman during that brief period where she was a, uh, a serious presidential candidate or appeared to be one, um, and uh, raised questions about whether or not vaccines, not COVID vaccines, obviously, uh, whether vaccines uh, uh, created uh, autism in, in children, something that's been you know widely uh, debunked, but it tapped into a movement. There's a movement out there. There's an anti-vaccine movement. It actually doesn't really ne necessarily fit neatly along political lines. I mean, Bobby Kennedy uh, Jr. is the most prominent uh, proponent of it all. Um, but once again, Trump was the accelerant here, not just in terms of uh, uh, of, of vaccines, but earlier on uh, in 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 the seriousness, how seriously to take uh, the virus and whether or not to do uh, significant lockdowns. Uh, you know, Trump initially saw this as a chance to show leadership. Uh, to uh, you know, to he called it the invisible enemy. He liked the idea of being a wartime president. This was a war against an invisible enemy, a war against a virus. Those first press conferences where he brought in Anthony Fauci and he brought out, you know, his entire coronavirus uh, team. He loved that image of having the, the the big power. But then he saw, and he was warned directly. I reported on this in in, in betrayal. He was warned. Um, by Brad Parscal, among others, and his pollsters uh, in his campaign, by the time late spring came along of 2020, uh, the the the, uh, the economic impact of of the of the COVID restrictions uh, and and fears about the virus were seriously jeopardizing his reelection prospects. I mean, Parscal. I mean. <laughs> exaggerating here, uh, but this is what he told Trump. He said, look, you know, uh, before this thing hit, you were going to get 400 electoral votes. Now, you know, it's going to be really hard to win re-election. Uh, so Trump, you know, you know, grabbed a hold of this movement that uh, was already there, but again, accelerated, um, you know, to, uh, to, to, to raise doubts about uh, what the medical experts were saying. And then when you get around to the vaccine development, I, I think one of the most significant decisions that Trump made as, as president um, under underappreciated is, you know, he got vaccinated, but he did so without telling anybody about it. Uh, he didn't, you know, uh, you know, every politician comes out, you bring the cameras in, you show, get everybody go out, do what I just did. Trump got vaccinated while he was still president, didn't tell anybody about it until, you know, after he had left the White House and never even to this day ever, you know, released a picture of it. And I think it was because he sensed that a lot of those people that were skeptical of vaccines, more than skeptical of vaccines, thought vaccines were, were, were something of an evil force, were his people. So again, not media, not not the media creating this. The media reflecting it. The polarization was there. I I, I think Fox's coverage actually of, of of the pandemic for much of it was was very responsible. Um, you know they 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 weren't they weren't repeating a lot of this stuff. I mean not not across the board for sure. Uh, but uh, but but I I don't think you can blame this on media coverage. Well, Chris, the proverbial elephant in the room is the surprising announcement that CNN Plus is shutting down at the end of this week. How should news consumers react? 
Are there already enough choices for news sources out there? And are the days of streaming already over? <laughs> wow, that was quick. Um, <laughs> that was a nice segue. I like that. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. And I've been, <laughs> as you know, a, uh, a, a victim of all of this in the last week. I, uh, when I came over to CNN Plus, um, I, there were some very smart people from Jeff Zucker to Jason Kyler on down who were saying that the uh, future of cable news was in great jeopardy because of the fact that, you know, you're seeing people unbundle. They're not getting these big, expensive 50 channel uh, cable deals anymore. And uh, as a result, you, you saw, I think, CNN has lost tens of millions of subscribers. Uh, so is Fox. Uh, you know that this was just a wave of the future, and the idea was you got to put get a foothold in the streaming world because that's where the future of news um, off the, the the mainstream networks is going to be. Now you have some equally smart people that have come in uh, with a diametrically opposed view. These are the new bosses uh, at CNN Plus. This, the one or Brothers Discovery, who've come to the conclusion that to have a narrow niche product uh, like a news streaming service doesn't work. I have absolutely no idea which is right and which is wrong, but uh, the Discovery people are in charge, and so they made the decision. I don't, I mean, in terms of, you know, a broad view of it, I, you know, I, it's so easy Two weeks ago, streaming was king. Now we've had the decision on CNN Plus. We've had the, the bad forecast about subscribers at Netflix. And suddenly, uh, you know, streaming is uh, in, in, a, uh, in an ICU on life support. I, I think that uh, probably the, the positive view of streaming and the negative view of streaming we're both uh, wildly exaggerated, and we're just going to have to wait and see. And some, you know, as in anything else, some people are going to be right and some people are going to be wrong. Uh, Jonathan's place of business still has an active streaming service, so does CBS and NBC. Um, the interesting thing, though, is what they've done, I mean, not to get too technical into the business side of it, is that they have free streaming that's ad-supported, as opposed to what um, what CNN was doing, which was completely subscriber supported with no ads, it'll be interesting to see. I think you're seeing a number of streaming services, including Netflix, deciding that maybe you need a cheaper service where you do have to pay a subscription fee, but you're, you're going to have an ads, ads as well. You're not just going to be able to watch, um, oh, what, uh, Squid Game for an hour uninterrupted. Could we make a little news? Do you know yet what's going to happen to you personally? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, no, no, I can't make news and no, I don't know. I mean, I'm, uh, we'll see, you know, I mean, my gosh, Jackie, it just happened on Thursday. <laughs> Give me a couple of days. Okay. I'm going to predict that whatever it is, Chris is going to be just fine. That's yeah, I, I think so. so. I agree. For one second, if I can, yeah. John. And, yeah. and I will say this, I am going to be fine. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. in good shape, whether it's at CNN or someplace else. Frankly, what, what I'm mostly concerned about right now and very is my team yeah. and the hundreds of other people. Because, you know, there were 300 people, I think, that, that had jobs at CNN Plus. Some of them had left yeah. CNN to go to streaming. Some of them had left other places, moved across the country. And so I think you're seeing a lot of the anchors at CNN plus doing everything they can to protect the people that were working on their team and to make sure they either get a safe landing at CNN or someplace else. Excuse me, John. And, and look, and, and CNN was hiring uh, for CNN plus. I mean, not, not just you, Chris and people, you know, people like, you know, like Casey, people like uh, Audie Cornish. I mean, hiring very good people that were, you know, kind of well-known, but, but also, uh, I mean, I know, personally, because I am, some of them are friends and former colleagues, uh, hiring some of the best in the business uh, uh, in terms of, of, of producers and the people who really work uh, behind the scenes uh, to, to, to make it possible what we do. So uh, I, you know, there, there's some, there's some very good people and I, um, 
you know, I applaud your efforts to make sure that, you, that your team uh, uh, finds a good landing place. Thank you. We'll uh, keep watching. As you said, it's uh, less than a week. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to move on now to our third topic, which is exploring the options the media may have to help decrease divisions. Um, it's a rare occasion these days when politicians of opposite parties will appear together to discuss debate and uh, to discuss or debate issues. Instead, press appearances often serve as opportunities to vilify and throw barbs at their opposing party. Fact checkers have had to work overtime over the last few years because of a lot of false or highly spun information is being put out by politicians during interviews. You've both referred to that uh, that reality. Um, last December, as he commented on former Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole's passing and the differences in society, former Senator Tom Daschle said, quote, social media has created an environment in which truth is just an option. John, tell us how you think we can fix this environment. Should journalists do a better job, perhaps, of fact-checking in real time? Well, well look, I, 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 one general comment here, I, I, I think. Uh, first of all, I, I'm, I'm sure Chris feels the same way. I feel very uncomfortable when people say the media, the media this, the media that. I mean, we, we have such a diverse media landscape. Uh, you know, Fox News, uh, MSNBC, CNN, that, even that's just one aspect of, of the media landscape. The New York Times, a uh, local newspaper, uh, uh, opinion magazines, uh, uh, National Public Radio, all, all operate in, 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 you know, different audiences operate in different ways. And when you try to bloggers, you know, people that are, uh, uh, you know, have, have their own presence, uh, on, on, on Twitter, that is effectively their own, you know, their own platform. So I think you have to be careful of, of, of overgeneralizing, but what I would like to say that what concerns me, um, is, uh, that as people, as, as we have so this proliferation of news sources and everybody has access to, to so much information and there's so much that's good about that. Um, the, the, the downside is that you can entirely tailor your news consumption to affirm your own biases, biases in your own beliefs um, and, and, and only get access to things that affirm what you already believe and not be challenged. Uh, one set of facts. You know, it used to be, you know, Daniel Patrick Moynihan famously said, "You're entitled to your own opinion. You're not entitled to your own facts." Well, now increasingly, people are <laughs> feel entitled to their own facts. They live in different universes. The media, the, the media diet they consume, uh, you know, reflects their their beliefs and has very little to do with 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 those uh, 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 who are from a different. A political perspective. Uh, so what I think is so important is that we recognize the importance of having news organizations that are dedicated to the idea of doing what, to, to quote uh, Roger Ailes here, <laughs> to fair and balanced news, uh, to, to news that strives towards objectivity, pure objectivity is impossible, but strives towards the idea that we are just going to give you the facts uh, we're not going to try to pr push an agenda. We're going to give you the facts. Now, there's plenty of room uh, for, for opinion journalists, uh, and there's some great opinion journalists out there uh, in print and television uh, and every medium. Uh, but, but you've got to be able to have, you know, news organizations, news organizations with resources uh, that have as their, their mandate, their mission, uh, uh, to, uh, to to report factually and to report, you know, in, in a fair and balanced way. Again, to borrow to borrow uh, Ailes's old phrase. We're talking in this section about possible solutions. And Chris, um, this is an idea. Should people who consistently tell lies be invited back as guests? <sighs> you know, I there was a big debate among Sunday show anchors about the election and people who challenge the election, whether you should just simply say, we're not going to put them on the air. And I was very much against that. Um, and, and, and as opposed to some of the other Sunday show 
anchors. I, I called it performative outrage. And one of the reasons I was against it is because you've got a lot of people who are very powerful in, in the government. Uh, the House uh, Republican leader McCarthy, to take one example, you could you a bunch of others, important senators, members of the Republican Party, to simply say we're not going to put them on the air is, I think, to cut yourself off uh, and your audience off from a lot of important policymakers. Now, if they did come on the air, I was always going to put them to the test and ask them those questions. But I, I don't I think just to ban them or boycott them, I'm pretty uncomfortable with that as a as a policy. If I, if I can answer this this question, I've really thought about it a lot about why why we're polarized and what we need to do about it. Um, I, I, two points I really want to make. One is uh, the one good thing for me personally about COVID, and there's not been much, is that I probably have read more books in the last two years than I had read in the previous 20. And one of the very best that I read was a book by Ezra Klein called Why We're Polarized. And while it's written from a liberal point of view, I think it's a really smart book. And, and he goes through a bunch of factors, but what he basically says, his conclusion, is that we're not two parties or two political philosophies, that we're two tribes. And depending on the tribe we're in, it says something about what party we belong to, what part of the country we live in, uh, who, where we pray or whether we pray, who we pray with, the food we eat. You know, there was a, a study that uh, was done of uh, this last election in 2020, the presidential election, and it measured how Trump and uh, Biden did by the counties that had either a Starbucks in them or a Cracker Barrel in them. And it turns out, not surprisingly, that in counties that had a Starbucks, the, the uh, Biden did very well. And conversely, ones that had Cracker Barrel, uh, Trump did very well. So I think it's it's more than than the, what news you consume. It's really become tribal. And we can talk about things, you know, people say, well, let's take out the algorithms off Facebook or, or uh, you know, but I, th I really think that the, the the original sin here, the biggest problem is the political polarization in the country. And I think un until you can solve that, and I have a, some thoughts about it, um, I, 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 I just think that we're going to have a country that is 50-50 and, and consuming, not only having different views, but also different truths. And, you know, there are some ideas out there, whether it's independent commissions, whether it's ranked choice voting, um, you know, I, I think a study was done and it looks, you know, we haven't finished the redistricting, but it looks like of the 435 districts uh, in the Congress for 2022, it looks like about 380 of them will be reliably Republican or reliably Democrat. And, and so, you know, all of the impetus, if you're a Republican member of Congress, is you don't have any fear at all of losing to a Democrat in your district because it's a safe red district. The only concern you have is if you move too far over uh, across the aisle to make a deal with a Democrat on some legislation that you're going to get primary by somebody who's to your right. And it's exactly the same with Democrats and, and moving too far away from the, uh, from the left. Um, and until you get a situation where in congressional districts and in races in generally, that there's a, a, a market incentive, a political incentive to move to the center, I think you're just going to have this tremendous lack, of, you know, to, to use the phrase of this group, uh, a lack of common ground. You've got to create political reform. And I think if that were to happen, there's an increase in chance you might get media reform as well. Although I will say, just fine, as a final note, uh, I have a good friend who deals with local news startups, both uh, um, electronic and print. And she was making a big pitch to some of these private investors and saying, you know, how about straight news? How about just tell it down the middle? And these, uh, and these investors, for a variety of outlets, say the market doesn't reward that. And that's the problem right now is the market doesn't reward straight down the middle news. It, re it, it rewards news with a point of view. And until we get away from that, I don't, you know, I don't think you can expect it's a, the news business, 
that news, either in print or electronic, is going to say, well, you know, we're going to take a loss, but we're going to tell it straight. We're planning to talk about that in a minute. But before we get there, you've referenced the midterms. And John, the midterms are just around the country. Mm -hmm. And it seems as if there are some politicians trying to be more outrageous than the next. I mean, this is the point, uh, Chris, you made about fearing a, uh, a, a challenger from further to either extreme if you try to work in the middle. Um, Will the major news networks continue to give these outrageous statements free airtime? Could a possible solution be for journalists to insist on politicians appearing together with someone from the other side of the aisle? Um, That way they could be denied airtime if they refuse. I mean, I I don't know uh, that that there's a lot of like free airtime given, uh, you know, to outrageous statements. I mean, for instance, I I can't think of the last time a Donald Trump um, uh, rally speech was carried live uh, on a on on a on a major network, even on even on Fox News. Um, You know, uh, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, to to pick a one uh, uh, who's known for for some of the outrageous uh, statements. you know her her audience. The, the way she she gets her message out is 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 through social media. It's 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 not she's not getting uh, booked on. Um, you know, I, well, I guess I guess there is an exception. We do see her on Tucker Carlson's show with some regularity, uh, but 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 you're not you're not seeing her get you know wide coverage uh, on the broadcast networks uh, on the cable networks on Fox. You know, outside of Tucker. Um, so I, I don't know that that's the issue, but, you know, I, the, the, you are, you have pinpointed an issue here, which is, you know, Chris and I have both spent a lot of time, um, anchoring Sunday shows, which I think are still play a very important role in having a, you know, a place where you can have a civil conversation and an in-depth conversation, uh, you know, there, there can be shouting on Sunday, but but it's you know it tends to be a you know longer longer form for longer more serious interviews, and it you know I mean it used to be that that it was standard uh, that you would you would bring on a you know a Democrat and a Republican you do a joint a joint interview I mean that almost never happens anymore, and uh, it's not because of the sun it's not because of the the show bookers the show anchors it's you know, a, a lot of these people refuse, uh, refuse to appear. And I guess you could, you said, you, would you say, look, you're not, we're not going to have you on. I mean, I guess, but I don't know how many, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know how effective that's going to be. Um, there's no, there's no, you know, media monopoly. Uh, there, 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 there are plenty of outlets. Uh, you can say, I'm not going to interview X, Y, or Z. Well, guess what? They'll find another place uh, to be on. And I, I just want to pick up on what, on one other thing that Chris said, because I entirely agree. This idea that you're going to, blanketly say, I'm not going to interview X, Y, or Z because, you know, uh, because of, 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 of where he stood on, on the election challenge. I mean, that's, I mean, Kevin McCarthy is highly likely to be, uh, the, 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 the speaker of the house. Um, are, are you going to say that you're not going to try to question the speaker of the house? I mean, are you really giving him some kind of a, you know, wonderful opportunity by having him on your show? Or are you doing your viewers a service by bringing somebody who has great power on your show and trying to, you know, ask him serious pointed questions, trying to hold him to account? Now, an entirely separate issue is here, will he go on shows? I mean, you know, he went and did an interview with with Chris. I think it was June of last year. It was like, I think maybe the last time he did a serious interview. I did uh-huh. an interview with him. It was for our 25th anniversary of Fox News Sunday. I think it was April okay. uh, that- uh, of, of 2021. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he got roughed up a little bit because we. I was asking him about the famous phone call where he, on January 6th, was talking to Trump. And, of course, he was denying stuff. Um, but, you know, it's interesting on this question, uh, Jackie, of of people coming on together. When I started at, at Fox News Sunday in 2003, it was routine. There were maybe yeah. a half dozen people in uh, in the Congress who wouldn't go on with somebody. And you kind of, you ate that, that it, the, the majority, the, the ranking leaders, the speaker and the top Republican or, or top Democrat, the top ranking leader in each house. Uh, and, uh, you know, John McCain, a presidential candidate or somebody like that. But everybody else would go on. And now nobody goes on. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you can be pure and and say, well, I'm not going to do it. But um, 
first of all, I think you're you're sh short scripting your audience because a lot of these people are powerful and, you know, you can hold them to account. They don't need somebody else on the other side to hold them to account. And secondly, you know, you could get yourself in a box where, yeah, I'll get two people who come on. There'll be two extremely junior congressmen who nobody wants to watch <laughs> anyway. So, you know, I don't know what you've accomplished there. <laughs> Right. You uh, in in your one of your earlier answers, Chris. You talked about uh, the business of news, and and that's what we wanted to turn to at this at this point. Um, people become journalists to tell stories, to uncover the truth. It was true, and the three of us all chose to become journalists. And my very young friends tell me that their motives today remain the same. But news is a for profit business. At the major networks, success is defined by ratings and by clicks. And those clicks and subscriptions define the success of print and digital news outlets. Recently, um, you may have been uh, in the audience too. Recently, I heard Eric Schmidt, who's the former CEO of Google, say to a Council on Foreign Relations audience that, quote, social media maximized revenue by maximizing outrage. It wasn't what we wanted but it happened. So maximizing, monetizing outrage wasn't always the model. When the networks were in fact founded, news was thought of as the proverbial loss leader, like those special items at the end of, of, ends of each supermarket aisle. The entertainment division was supposed to make money and news was intended to be a public trust, if not a public service. Um, Chris, we didn't perceive that our earliest years were the glory days of broadcast journalism. Do you think we can we can ever get back there? I think it's going to be very hard. It's funny. I was on Stephen Colbert uh, on March 28th, the day before CNN Plus launch. Man, that doesn't seem so long ago, but it, in some ways it seems like it's a lifetime ago. And he asked me about this very question. And uh, I semi-kiddingly, but not entirely, blamed it on my father. And here's here's uh, my, my claim about this. Um, I completely agree with you. In, in uh, the, the 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, news was considered a public service and a loss leader. And, and, you know, that isn't where the networks made their money. And look, some other TV historian would, ha would have a different view of it. I think 60 Minutes had a lot to do with it because 60 Minutes became so incredibly successful and, and was, uh, I think, creating $50 million a year pure profit in the 70s and 80s just out of news, that one show. I, I think at one point it was, it, it was uh, responsible for half of the profits of the entire CBS television network that I think that that kind of uh, put an end to that game. And suddenly people saw, you know what? News can be very profitable. It can make a lot of news. It's a, a lot of money. It's a lot cheaper to put on than a show with actors and cameras and, uh, uh, you know, uh, scenery and all of that stuff, f uh, fiction. And, uh, and clearly you've seen... Uh, in cable news, and I would argue also in, in you know, I don't want to make it seem like cable news is this bazaar and that, uh, that everybody else is so pure. I see a lot of this at the New York Times. I see a lot of this in the mainstream television networks. Um, everybody's pursuing ways to maximize dollars now. And, you know, to a certain degree, as we've seen, you got to do it or you're going to go out of business. And, uh, and, and part of that is chasing an audience and part of that is, unfortunately, telling them what they want to hear. That's that's essentially the next question that we we had uh, thought about when you you both uh, have hosted or currently host Sunday news shows. When you're selecting topics and guests, how much do ratings play into your decision making, John? I mean. I I'm not doing that, but I mean, there certainly are people that are. And, and if I'm not doing well, it's, you know, uh, you know, I'm not probably not going to have the chance to continue doing, d doing what I do. Uh, but I, you know, I'm not, I'm trying to focus on the news. And I, and I think that one, you know, mistake that can happen uh, is if you're purely focused on ratings, uh, it can backfire because the thing that really matters in the long term is credibility. 
I, I used to work at CNN. I spent eight years working at CNN. And CNN went through a period uh, when I was there where it seemed like every time there was a damn car chase, uh, the, the network would carry it live. You know, there'd be the helicopter footage. There's a car chase in Chicago. There's a car chase in L.A. Oh, my God, where's the guy going to go there? He went over the medium. Let's follow him. Nobody knows what he's running from or what the, you know, what the, but it's it's like riveting TV. And you don't, you don't want to change the channel until you find out where the car crashes. And then you'll change the channel um and 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 the the this this little fad that see it didn't last very long but that, that, that cnn went through of carrying repeated car chases was driven by the fact that it had a short-term ratings impact because yeah the, the, you know people weren't turning the channel while the car was being chased so therefore the the ratings went up um and of course, it all started with OJ and the Bronco. I mean, this is this is this is a little after the Bronco. I mean, that was a, that was a, that was a different kind of car chase. That was maybe at least we knew what that car chase was all about. Um, but um, you know, you 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 erode your credibility. You hurt your ability to have a sustaining an audience that trusts you and 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 sees you as a source of news that matters. You know, I, I think that I think that one thing that we have seen in cable television. Um, particularly in prime time is that uh you know outrage uh works um that the more pent up and angry you are about something the more you can you know tee off on what, what whatever issue it is you know you, you you gain an audience um but 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 again does it does it does it work over time? Uh, I think that one of the things that CNN is looking at, you know, I mean, Chris probably has a better sense of this than, than me, is that, you know, was it was it a mistake? Has it been a mistake to try to follow that model and try to compete with MSNBC, for instance, uh, over a, a marginal, you know, 10, 50,000 viewers to say you, you're bragging points over you won, you know, a time slot uh, by, by ramping up, amping up the outrage if it, over time, erodes your brand and CNN's brand, and I think it still is the CNN brand, is straight news and news you can trust. You know, often when you turned in prime time, maybe that wasn't the message you 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 necessarily got. It looked it looked pretty opinionated. Uh, and that was working maybe for that time slot at that given moment, but does it cost does it does it hurt you in the long run? Uh, you know, I mean, I'll give one specific example. You know, when Chris Cuomo had a show, you know, and uh, you know, bringing on his brother uh, would would from a journalistic standpoint seem like God. That doesn't seem quite right. We should probably have somebody else interview. I watched New York, but but people it was watched. cute. <laughs> people watched, so they did it again, and they did it again, and of course they all know, got fired. Cuomo liked it, and you know, Chris was rewarded. But what did it do over time? Did it did it erode did it erode some credibility? Um, so you know you, you can't just look at ratings because I think that's also a failed that will ultimately be a failed business model too, not just a failed journalistic model. I'm looking at the clock. I think we should move to the audience questions that we have because a lot of them touch on um, some current currently uh, percolating issues. Um, Donna, for example, asks, do you agree that the demise of the fairness doctrine has contributed to rising political polarization? Do you see an opportunity for citizens to lobby to restore its key provisions to require that the holders of broadcast licenses present controversial issues of public importance and to to fairly air differing viewpoints? Chris, you first. Um, you know, I think I've used this uh, metaphor before in this hour. I, the idea of putting the genie back in the bottle, yeah. uh, I think, is is impossible. Um, you know, one can argue about the fairness doctrine, but it ended, what, in the 80s and the 90s, and you saw Rush Limbaugh then start coming out and providing very, uh, very acerbic and obviously opinionated uh, commentary uh, and you, you've seen it not as successfully, at least in talk radio from the left. And, you know, I mean, the flip side of that, rather, rather than I, I, I think this idea and we, it sort of has come up several times. Well, the way to do it is to restrict journalists, you know, say you, you won't put on a certain kind of guest or you have to do this kind of. You know, the fact of the matter is back back when they had the fairness doctrine, we were talking about three 
television networks and, and local stations, there's been such an explosion through technology of, of, of over the air and cable and streaming and internet. Um, you know, it's not like all the views aren't being expressed. There's a huge marketplace of ideas. Um, you know, I remember the, the last time I did this was actually in February of 2020, just before the world ended with COVID. Mm -hmm. And I was up at Columbia with Maggie Haberman, and we did one of these common ground seminars. And what I said at that time, somebody said, what, what, what to do? I, 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 the, ideally, what I would love, if I could prescribe it, is say, Everybody ought to read or consume, watch a, a, a news source that they that challenges them, that they disagree with. If you if you love Fox News, uh, read the front page of The New York Times. If you love MSNBC, read the editorial page of The Wall Street Journal. You know, I, I don't think the answer is to shrink the choices. I think it, and I don't know how you do this, but I think the answer is for people to have some incentive or some reason to to be exposed to contrary points of view so that almost like a, a a GPS system, they're able to triangulate and figure out where they are, what they believe. I want to get in this question from Tina, who asks, can you tell us about the role of polarization in politics outside of the U.S.? Today, we had the election in France, and even though uh, Emmanuel Macron won, his uh, margin was smaller than it had been five years ago. Um, is, this, is there a contagion of polarization going global, and does it compound the danger? Jump ball, either of you want to take that? Um, well, I'll just uh, pick up on one thing regarding the fairness doctrine in France, since you brought it up. You know, France has a very strict fairness doctrine. And before the, in the first round of, of elections, you had, uh, what was it, 12 presidential candidates, some of them quite French. I think there were two different Trotskyite uh, uh, candidates. Uh, and because of the strict fairness doctrine, uh, as they got in the window where it was required that if you were going to carry you know, anything from one candidate, you had to carry from all of the candidates, basically the campaign disappeared from, you know, from, uh, 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 from broadcast coverage. Uh, so it wasn't – the, the intended effect was not exactly what, uh, uh, what, what, what you saw take place. Uh, but no, I think I think that, that this is an issue uh, globally, clearly, um, you know, polarization. And what 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 I worry about is, um, you know, we, we've had this period of, uh, uh, you know, relative peace and prosperity, uh, the expansion of democracy uh, and, you know, it's it, it all seems so inevitable. I remember George W. Bush in 2005 in his second inaugural talking about, you know, ending tyranny in the world. And, um, you know, you what what I think what we've realized is, is it's all a lot more fragile uh, than, than, than perhaps a lot of us thought. And, you know, an organization that I worked for a thousand years ago, Freedom House, you know, is tracked every year. They put out a, a survey of freedom in the world. And it's been a, in, and for, for, you know, for two plus decades uh, following the, the fall of the Soviet Union, it was, a, it was the story of the expansion of freedom and democracy. And it's no longer that. That's not the story anymore. It's, it's the contraction. I didn't know you worked for Freedom House. I served on that board. Mm -hmm. We unfortunately have run out of time. We've uh, had such a rich uh, conversation. So before we uh, sign off, I uh, just, oh, I, I thought I'd gotten the hook. Anyway, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, <laughs> good. Let's uh, let's go to the uh, a question that was a real humdinger that came in from, uh, what is her name? From uh, Melanie. Now buckle your seatbelts, guys. Melanie wants to know, how are the American people supposed to have any faith in our government when you can literally plot to overthrow it and then continue to serve in it? She continues and asks when their votes are sold to the highest bidder, when a person under federal investigation for sex trafficking is embraced by half of the people in it, and when the Supreme Court justice's wife uses her influence to pressure elected officials uh, in a coup. Should the media be paying more attention to these stories? Well, well I mean, go ahead, Chris. Uh, well, I was just going to say, you know, I, I always laugh when people uh, 
ask questions like that because I would say, uh, how do you know about all these? <laughs> you know about them because they've been in the media. I mean, you know, you, you can argue, well, uh, Clarence Thomas should recuse himself, but ultimately that's his choice as to what to do. But I wouldn't say it's, you know, or how do you know that somebody is being investigated for sex trafficking because it's been in the media? Um, so, I, you know, I don't think you can really blame that on the media not covering it. Uh, the solution or the lack of solution may be very troubling, but I don't think it's that the information hasn't gotten out there. Yeah, it's been thoroughly it's been thoroughly covered. I mean, one of those major points that she mentioned, I wrote an entire book about. Um, uh, I mean, I, it's I, I don't think the issue is that, that the stories. I, I agree, I, and and I appreciate uh, the questioners, uh, you know, frustration and deep concern. Uh, in many ways, I, I, I share much of that concern, uh, but. I don't think this is a question of, well, if only the media were covering X, Y, or Z, things would be different. Okay. Now, we have come to the end of our time for questions, uh, but I want to give each of you two minutes, two or three minutes, to sum, sum up your points of view. Um, we've established uh, that where, journal, where the journalistic community has been, we've outlined a number of vexing problems. Can you leave us with any words of hope or words of inspiration? What would you like people to take away from this discussion tonight? Is there any chance you're optimistic about the future of journalism? I know that I am gratified whenever I uh, talk to Gen Z and millennials who have such a, a, a powerful sense of mission and purpose. Um, what can each of us do to help heal the incivility and polarization facing our nation? Chris, do you want to start and then John? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I don't think we should be too uh, d depressed or downcast or wringing our hands. I mean, the fact is there's some great reporting that goes on uh, every day. Uh, and, and, and a number of these news sources, which I think have a, a tilt right or left, there's a lot of great reporting that, that goes on. Um, and, and, you know, so I, I, I guess I think, and I understand that's the, the subject of this particular meeting, but to a certain degree, I think maybe the, the, the focus is in the wrong direction. Because in the end, it's not, it's not the institution. It's not like, well, media has to clean up its act or government has to clean up its act. I think in the end, it, it's on really on citizens. Um, you know, if, if you want a different government and if you want a different um, a, a, a different climate in the country, a different political ecology, it's on each of us in our various roles to to push for it, to demand it. I mean, we have seen this in the past. I, I agree with John. We're going through a tough spell right now in terms of polarization. Uh, in terms uh, of extremism. But, you know, we've had waves in the past and they dissipate. And, you know, you, I, in my lifetime, uh, in the 60s, when uh, generations decided they were going to end the war in Vietnam or they were going to give civil rights to, uh, uh, you know, provide equity and civil rights to, to African-Americans and other minorities and, and to women, Things change, and ultimately, it's on the citizen, the citizenry, and on each of us as individuals and collectively uh, to, to demand change and to push for change. And and you know, in the end, I think to some degree, we get the government we deserve or we've earned. And if we want to change it, it's up to us to do so. John, any and, and, uh, thoughts? Any optimism? First of all, I, I, I'd say I, I, I would say bravo to, to all that. I, I, I agree with what Chris just said. I, I would say I think one of the biggest challenges that we face right now um, is an, an erosion in uh, uh, the, the idea of truth. Uh, you know, you have, you know, as, as I said, uh, uh, we talked about earlier, uh, people that, you know, we, we have the the, the, our polarized political system where each side uh, is is operating, it seems, in its own world, its own universe, operating with its own set of facts. Um, and I think that 
the key to getting out of all of this is uh, is 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 having you know not not journalists as crusaders to fix all that is wrong uh, with with our politics, but journalists who say that we are going to uh, to do our jobs, which is to collect facts, to report the news, and to do it without fear or favor. Uh, we, we're not pursuing an agenda. Our only agenda is to pursue the truth, um, and and to reaffirm the importance of doing that. Um, and then, you know, our, 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 our political differences will be hashed out, but you've got to be able to have a common sense of here are the facts. Um, so we need to stand up for those facts uh, and, and, and not be, you know, like I said, there's plenty, plenty of, of space in the world for, uh, uh, for, for people with opinions, for opinion journalism, but there's got to be, a that there we, we need to have news organizations we need to have reporters who are dedicated to nothing more than pursuing the truth and pursuing the facts insofar as we have the ability to uh, to discern uh, what the truth is uh, as for the, my optimistic note uh, I think we have gone through an intensely polarized uh, period we're in the midst of it now uh, we've had polarized periods as as Chris mentioned uh, uh, in our country uh, in some ways worse than what we are going through now. and i I sense in the people that I speak to um, that, uh, that that there is a uh, the, the pendulum will swing. There's a real frustration with it. the the The, the extremes have dominated our politics uh, 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 for for some time. And I think there's some some frustration with that, and and uh, you know I'm I am cautiously optimistic uh, that we will get through all of this, um, and we will go through you know another set of <laughs> another set of issues, uh, but but the extreme polarization, um, you know, th th there are, there are enough people that are sick of it, frankly. Maybe one answer is to have more conversations, just like the one we've just had for the last hour. Chris and John, thank you so much for your experience. Thank you for your wisdom. Um, and thank you, everyone, for watching. So, but, but right now, don't go away. We're going to turn the proceedings over to the CEO of Common Ground Committee, Bruce Bond, for some final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. It's been a very enlightening evening, and I do think it lived up to Common Ground Committee's motto of bringing light, not heat, to public discourse. After listening to tonight's discussion, I hope the conversation between these outstanding guests has brought you a sense of hope that we can heal our divisions, the inspiration to engage civilly and productively in your own conversations, and has built a better understanding and trust in the work of the media. An informed public is essential to democracy. On behalf of Common Ground Committee, I want to thank you all for attending this evening. If you'd like to find out more about Common Ground Committee, please go to commongroundcommittee.org. And to find out more about the Bridge Alliance, go to bridgealliance.us. We are honored that this evening's event was part of the National Week of Conversation. And finally, a big thanks to tonight's terrific moderator, Jackie Adams, and our very distinguished panelists, Chris Wallace and Jonathan Carl. And please sign up for our newsletter so you don't miss any of our upcoming events this year. On June 7th, we'll be partnering with New York City's 92Y for an event focusing on election reform with former DNC and former RNC chairs, Donna Brazil and Michael Steele. You don't want to miss it. Thanks again and good night, everybody. <laughs>